Heights. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, first, uh, this Sunday is our Communion Sunday, so we'll celebrate our Lord's Supper, and we'll do that uh, at the end of our normal service on Sunday morning. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, also, uh, keeping our prayers, uh, 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 Dean, I don't know if it's a first name or last name, but the Dino family, uh, who uh, it was a fellow by the name of Dino, passed away, a uh, friend of Linda's and uh, Kevin's. And uh, or co-worker and uh, passed away this past week, so we're going to keep their pr- uh, family and friends in prayer in the coming days. Um, also, um, just to let you know, if anybody doesn't know uh, about this, but there's actually a play uh, that will be running up in Boston August 8th through the 11th called The Screwtape Letters. And remember C.S. Lewis and his uh, book, The Screwtape Letters, which is a fantastic book about kind of demonic influence, um, uh, uh, during our day and age and how uh, demons tend to influence us and the organization of that. A uh, great book by C.S. Lewis, and there's a play associated with that and, and about that uh, that runs up in Boston, again, August 8th through the 11th. So if you would be interested in, in uh, uh, doing that, I'll announce this on Sunday, and if uh, there's a group of people that would like to get together, maybe you could call and uh, get uh, 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 group seating. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to be going away, so I'm not going to be here during that time. Uh, but if I was here, I definitely would be going to see this. So, again, uh, I'll talk more about this on Sunday. But if you want to see anything more about it tonight, you can pick that up after our service. All right. Uh, let's see. Any other things going on? Prayer requests or whatnot? Uh, keep uh, uh, Beth in our prayers. Uh, she's having an uh, ultrasound tomorrow on her a uh, gallbladder to uh, see if she has stones. She might have passed some stones. We're not quite sure. Uh, but uh, we'll see uh, if uh, anything is still there. Uh, so keep her in prayer if you could. Uh, other than that, normal schedule, okay. And uh, for the next, uh, this week and next week anyway, and I'll make some announcements on Sunday. All right, so anything else? All right, so let's begin. We begin as we normally do with a moment of silent prayer, giving ourselves an opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1 9, the rebound technique, to ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor, without which we cannot learn or apply the Word of God. So, if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <coughs> And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this day to praise you, to worship you, and to glorify you through the study of your word. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us individually, for providing all of our logistical grace blessings, for providing for our every need, both physically and spiritually. We thank you for the word that you are now giving us this evening, and we ask that this word be powerful and meaningful for our lives so that we learn and edify our souls and therefore walk in your will. And in your plan, as we walk in fellowship with your Son, Jesus Christ, more and more each and every day, serving you as we serve one another. So, Father, we thank you for providing those things for us, as well as the freedoms that we have within our nation, the freedom of speech and freedom of religion. We ask that you maintain those things within our country so that we glorify you to the maximum. We thank you for our church that gives us a place to come and learn the truth of your word, to worship and serve you as we do. And we ask that you lead us all to mightily serve and walk in your will through this church as we go out and witness to those who are lost and dying in this world. So, Father, we also pray for our president, that you be with him and his family, protecting and guiding him, that you lead him in all his decision-making authority according to your will. We also pray for our military, our police, and firemen that stand on guard on our behalf here at home and around the world. We ask that you be with all of them and bless them according to your will. We thank you, Father, for their service and their sacrifice. We pray for my wife, Beth, and her, uh, 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 what is it, CAT, not CAT scan, uh, what do you call it, uh, not MRI, ultrasound, thank you, and for the ultrasound that she's going to have tomorrow on her gallbladder, we ask that all goes well there, and she uh, get good diagnosis, and you continue to bring healing and recovery to her. We pray for the Dino family, and we ask that you be with them at the loss of a loved one. We pray for Cheryl Rock and her family as uh, her brother-in-law Jim is going through the dying process. And Father, we just ask that you bring him home to glory, give him dying grace and blessing during this process according to your will. And we thank you, Father, for another victory in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we also 
continue to offer up prayers for anybody else in our local assembly that may have need in any way. And you know what their uh, prayers are and what their needs are, Father. And we ask that you work mightily in their lives and answer their prayers according to your will. So, Father, we again, we thank you for this time that we have gathered together. We ask that you lead us now in praise and in worship. In Christ's name, amen. All right, and if Cheryl could come forward, please, for our doxology. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, my life to you I bring. May each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing. In your time. Thank you, and please be seated. <clears throat> All right, let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. And as we continue to understand Jesus Christ presenting his authority and his uh, ministry, bringing it now to mankind, ultimately we're seeing that he has authority uh, over demons, over man, and now we're seeing it o also over the despised as we see him ultimately uh, uh, working and talking at the party that Matthew threw, which is also known as Levi in our gospel, at the uh, uh, celebration of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, being in his midst just after Jesus Christ had called him. And as we know, we've seen the call of Matthew as he throws the big dinner party. Right after that, we see the rebuke and grumblings of the Pharisees in the bridegroom analogy, which we talked about on Tuesday night in verses 33 through 35, and how the Pharisees, the scribes, and really John's disciples were questioning Jesus and his disciples as to why they do not fast like the rest of them. And we found out all the great analogy that was associated with that, basically saying that they were sinners and in league with Satan because they were not fasting. Now we also understand in this third part, which is the last part in last section of chapter 5, we see Jesus giving great parables about the old and the new, where he uses garments, wine, and wineskin to really give us a great understanding of the old versus new regarding the spiritual life and the ages that Jesus Christ was now uh, 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 operating in going from the age of law now into the age of grace. So we're going to see all of this in the garments, the wine, and the wineskin analogy. As we note, again, Luke chapter 5 in verse 36 down through verse 39. Now, I'm not going to be able to get through all of this this evening because there's really a lot of information. And again, doing a word study as we've been doing uh, throughout this and uh, seeing in the, this last section, there are many, many words that are very important doctrinally and scripturally, categorically throughout the scriptures. And so I want to give you all of that so that you can understand all of the different analogies and the overall story that our Lord is speaking to. Yes, we can summarize it in a few quick words, but to have a better understanding of what's truly going on and all the other aspects and utilizations of these things throughout Scripture gives us a greater understanding and more appreciation for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's read it from the English first, now in verse uh, 36 down through verse 39. But again, uh, as it says in verse 33, uh, and, and they said to him, the disciples of John often fast, again going back to verse 33, often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. In other words, they don't fast and they're not offering prayers. They're just being gluttons and ultimately they're operating like sinners with sinners as we've been talking uh, throughout and have seen. Then in verse 34, we see Jesus' response and Jesus said to them, You cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? He brings in a wedding analogy and offsets their fasting uh, a duration towards him by helping them to understand 
It's a time of celebration. The bridegroom is here. Jesus Christ is amongst us. The God, the Savior, our Messiah King. Now in verse 34 it says, But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. And again, we talked about the analogy of fasting when someone would mourn. It was done in ancient pagan societies uh, in in the, the worship of false gods. It was also done sometimes wrongly in the Old Testament in the fasting of the death of an individual that might have had or been steeped in the ancient pagan religions as well. And especially, as we noted, the fertility gods of the Phalic cult, as we've talked about in the past. Now we get into verse 36, where Jesus just continues on, and he gives another parable. It says, and he was also telling them a parable. And within this parable, we actually have three analogies. We have a garment, we have wine, and we have wine skins. And in all of that, we have, again, the contrasting comparison of the old versus the new. So in verse 36, he said, uh, and he also was telling them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. So that's number one. Then number two, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be split, sp- uh, excuse me, spilled open and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And there, really, the Greek says new wine skins. I don't know why they changed it to fresh here. But in any case, I think we could understand with new wine uh, skins. Now, in verse 39, it says, And no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new. For he says the old is good enough. All right, so we have garments, we have wineskins, we have wine itself. In the last two, we see wine being associated with the uh, wineskins as well. So we bring that analogy into it. But all of this is giving us some great understandings of the old then entering into the new. And as Jesus Christ was talking to these Pharisees, the scribes, and also the disciples of John, he was giving them the understanding of the old way of doing things under the law. Now there's a new way of doing things. Now as we go forward into a new age. And Jesus Christ was giving them the transition from the age of Israel, which is called the age of the law, into the new age that would come after the day of Pentecost, after Jesus' ascension, where then the church age or the age of grace would begin. And within that, now that Jesus Christ had come, and this is what we got to focus on and understand, now that Jesus Christ has come, now that the bridegroom is within our midst, there is a new way of doing things, and there is a new mode of operation for the spiritual life. We're no longer under the law. We are no longer under the spiritual life that was appropriate for the age of the law. Now there's going to be a new spiritual life, a new mode of operation as we continue to go forward. That's the overall message. But in all of this, and it's fascinating how Jesus used certain words, and then Luke, again, in his uh, writing of them, uses these specific words that are unique to these narratives and then also have application, some of the other words have application in other unique narratives in regard to the life of Christ, especially when we talk about the cross of Jesus Christ. Now at this time, Jesus Christ was about three years away, maybe two years away from the cross, so they couldn't cross-reference pun intended, okay, these things with what happened at the cross at this point in time. But remember, God knew that these things would be written down. So Jesus Christ was giving an object lesson to these self-righteous, legalistic, arrogant, some believers and some unbelievers at this point in time. He was giving them just a direct analogy for them to understand old versus new, to get them to say, oh, there's a new way of doing things, and new things are coming. 
But God also knew, Jesus Christ also knew that these things would be documented and written for us in the Scripture so that we could delve into this and dissect it the way I've done for you this evening. And again, a lot of information in your notes. We won't go over all of that detail. But ultimately, that man would be able to dissect it for the next 2,000 years, right up until our day and age. And then, oh, oh by the way, for the rest of eternity. Because we're going to be dissecting the Bible for all of eternity. That's how powerful the Bible is. And sometimes people maybe get bored or think it's tedious to get into the depth and detail that I get into and other good pastor teachers who are teaching from the Scriptures and not just teaching these fluffy topical subjects from time to time. Or all, That's all they do is teach fluffy topical discussions. No, we are to delve into the Word of God and understand it. And we are to look at the Word of God daily. Daily we should be looking at the Scriptures and dissecting it and understanding it so that we can grow in our relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and with God. So again, delving into this, we have greater understanding. And now from a 2020 hindsight vision, we can look at these things and say, okay, this was going on and this is what Jesus said to these Pharisees. And then this is what happened prior to that that would give them understanding of what this parable would be about. And then we can even look now from that point forward to the cross of Jesus Christ and other episodes in the life of Christ and get the analogy of how this all is working together. And oh, by the way, as Jesus Christ has changed topics from, you know, fasting and feasting and the bridegroom and the healing of a leper and healing of other sick individuals, as we've seen in chapter 5 thus far, as we now look into the garment, the wineskin and the wine, these two have analogy, but from a different viewpoint and perspective, all back to the same things we've been talking about, the reason for healing, the reason for exercising lepers, and ultimately uh, what he was doing now as he was having a party with sinners. Again, to heal them from their sins. It all has to do with that. The healing of our sins for all of mankind, and especially for those who believe, receiving the forgiveness of their sins that leads to eternal life. All right? So with that backdrop, let's look at verse 36. Now in verse 36 it says, And he was also telling them a parable. And again, we've noted uh, you know, the parable and telling them. He's speaking it now. We see that. It says, No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. And it, interesting enough, in your notes I've given you the detail of this word for tears. It's a shizo, C, uh, excuse me, S-C-H-I-Z-O. And basically, that has a, has a secondary meaning to mean tear. First and foremost, it means to break, to chop, to cleave, to divide, to open, to rent or rend, to separate, split, and then also tear. So it has some greater connotation there, and it really is a very powerful word. Again, we think of just tearing some, you know, a little piece of garment, but it has more analogy and it has more understanding. This is uh, uh, great because we really see in this analogy the old versus the new and how the old and the new are not compatible. As it says, when you put a new patch of cloth on an old garment or an old patch of cloth on a new garment, one is going to stretch and the other is not. And as a result, it's going to tear apart. And the two are going to come apart, if not uh, just coming apart from each other, but destroying each other in the process. If the new, uh, you know, uh, shrinks down or even expands, then it's going to tear the old. That isn't ready to expand. It may just tear apart from it, but it may rip that apart as well. Or the old is going to stick to the new that's trying to stretch and expand, or even if it was trying to shrink, as our new clothing tends to shrink, okay? But again, using the wineskin analogy, you put the wine in, and in a new, and it tends to expand, okay? So it can go either way. But the fact of the matter is, when you put the old with the new, it's not going to be compatible. They are going to be separated anyway. And But in the process, when you try to put the old and new together, potentially both are destroyed. Neither one is no good. 
So it's really a waste of time, and it's something that should not happen. What's interesting about this is that we can also read in the Gospel of Matthew 27 and Mark chapter 15 that this word was also used when the veil in the temple was torn in two after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And what was that all about? I should have a picture for you, but I don't. Maybe on Sunday I'll bring a picture. But you all have seen the pictures. You know uh, in your mind's eye. But remember, in the tabernacle, there was the first room called the holy place and the back room called the holy of holies. And dividing those two things was a huge curtain that some say was about six inches thick. And again, that's a big, thick piece of cloth. And you couldn't take two elephants and tie them together and say, go in different directions and have that thing rented in two. Well, maybe you could. But again, that would be a lot of power and strength in order to tear that in two. Certainly, it's not humanly possible for man to do that. But yet, at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, God rent that curtain in two. And that speaks volumes to what we're talking about right here. Because first and foremost, it was first an insult to the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were all about their their human good works, uh, uh, worship and ceremonies and good deeds from a humanistic standpoint up to what their legalistic, self-righteous arrogance was all about. And so therefore, first and foremost, it destroyed their worship process. And remember, to them, the Holy of Holies was to be separated from the holy place. And no one could go back to that Holy of Holies. And that was according to the law. But again, because of their misapplication of the law, God is ripping it apart. That's the negative aspect towards the unregenerated unbeliever. The good part of this is also the analogy of the opening up of the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, and you had the, uh, 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 the Ark of the Covenant, uh, uh, which you had the lid called the Mercy Seat on top with the two cherubim angels facing down. That was called the Mercy Seat, the place of judgment of Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament analogy, when uh, Moses uh, or God needed to talk to Moses or sometimes the high priest, he would go in and he would have face-to-face relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in a theophany in the Old Testament. And only the high priest could go in. It was a holy of holy places. No one could just go in. But by breaking that curtain in two or tearing it in two, now it opened that holy of holies up to what? All people. And it gave all people access to the holy of holies. And the holy of holies had access now to all people. And that is a great picture of Jesus Christ and his completed work upon the cross. Remember, that was ripped in two after, right after Jesus Christ paid for our sins and then said, it is finished. And said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Right at that point, it was rent in two, which meant it opened up the Holy of Holies, to everybody. It gave access of Jesus Christ to all of mankind. And again, none of that's in your notes, but I'm giving that all to you uh, because I think you know some of this analogy already. But in any case, it all was part of the tearing in two, giving all of mankind access to God. And the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross gives all of mankind now access to salvation. And it's a new mode of operation. It's no longer a secret or just a few could enter in. Now everybody has access. All right. So that's also noted in the book of Hebrews, chapter six, chapter nine and chapter 10, as I have up there on the board. A great understanding and analogy as a result of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And right off off the top, uh, you know, right off the bat, right off the top. That first analogy points to what? The cross of Jesus Christ and his completed work. Guess what? All the rest of these words that I'm going to give you, and we see within this passage, all the way down to verse 39, all have analogy and point back to the cross of Jesus Christ directly. All right? So let's get another one in. This was also used by Mark to describe when the heavens were opened. Remember when Jesus Christ was baptized by John and then all of a sudden the heavens were opened and the dove came down, which was the the, uh, theophany or visible representation of the Holy Spirit entering into Jesus Christ? Well, this word is used there. The heavens were opened. 
rent in two, torn apart. And now, as we've seen, heaven and earth were one. Rather than being separated as they were before, the heavens being opened now made it two. And this also was a great uh, visible manifestation of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to the body of Jesus Christ, who is the prototype for the spiritual life for the church age believer that is now a new age and a new spiritual life that every church age believer gets to receive. Jesus Christ began it, and this word is used in that analogy as well. And Jesus Christ began his ministry where he began the process of making all things new. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, as well as in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, where again, at the end of the millennial reign, all things will be made new. There's another analogy in there as well <clears throat> that we can talk about, because this word is also used along with another one that we're going to see, and we're going to talk about it more there. But remember when Jesus Christ went to the cross, the soldiers did what? They took his garments. They took his outer coat or his outer covering, and they took his inner covering, which we would say his underwear. Again, but they had more like a long john type of thing. He had two pieces of clothing. One they tore up. The other, they decided not to because it was made all of one piece. So we can't tear that up. It's a great piece of material. And let's cast lots and see which one of us will get that. You see, at first, they tore up a piece of clothing, and that's the word that we have here, shidzo. Okay, we have that word used again at the cross of Jesus Christ when the soldiers divided up his garments. And then the other one, the word garment that we're going to see a little bit later on, they decided, again, let's cast lot, lots for his garment and let's see who gets to receive that of us because we shouldn't tear that. It is too nice and it's too perfect. So that does what? It takes us right to the cross. And it takes us right to the cross where unbelievers are what? Tearing apart Jesus Christ, as it were. Tearing apart his clothing. And then casting lots, which also was in fulfillment of Scripture. So that's another great analogy just from this one word, tear. We see three of them all pointing to the work of Jesus Christ and the new spiritual life that would come. Again, heaven opening up, the dove coming down, beginning the new ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We also see that the piece of cloth and garment are both used at that cross, or that's what I just talked about, of the soldiers, where they were casting lots for his garment. And that was again prophesied at Psalm, in Psalm chapter 22, verse 18. And it's interesting that all four Gospels talk about that event. You see, many times we see the events of Jesus, and only three or one or two of the Gospels speak about it. In this case, all four Gospels speak of this process, and they talk about it in fulfillment of Scripture. So we know it's all coming and pointing right back to the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what's also interesting about the word for piece of cloth, which again, I gave it to you in your notes, which is epibleme, okay, epiblema, we could say, that word is used in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, and it's used for the word cloak. So we see the word cloak also coming to the fore. And that's what brings us into the next aspect of the cloak of Jesus Christ, because we see in the Gospels, in Matthew, in Mark, and Luke, we see the cloak of Jesus Christ being very important in what? His healing ministry because in these accounts people would go up and just touch his cloak and they would touch that garment that the soldiers were dividing later on or, or or casting lots over later on and they would touch that cloak of Jesus Christ and as a result what they would be healed and sometimes as we know Jesus Christ would heal somebody he'd say a word and they would be healed. He'd touch them. He'd say a word. He'd spit in his hands and get some mud and rub it on them, their eyes or something, and they would have sight. Other times, people would just touch his garment, and they would be healed because it all had to do with their faith. And as a result of their faith, they were healed. 
So when we understand this piece of cloth that he is talking about, the old garment versus the new garment, we're seeing there's an old way that you would clothe yourself in the spiritual life of the Old Testament. Now there's a new way that you would be clothed with the new cloak that is Jesus Christ that would be part of the new age that is about to arrive and come on to the scene. So all of this is pointing to that, and it all, again, goes back to the cross. Because the healing that Jesus would perform, yes, it would literally heal them of their illnesses and their sicknesses, but we all know that that was the greater message of what? Him paying the price for our sins, so that we'd be healed of our sins, forgiven of our sins, and then having eternal life. So again, every time we see a healing, it's an analogy for the work upon the cross. He would pay for our sins, and then those who would believe upon his work would ultimately have forgiveness of their sins with all the resultant benefits that come along, including eternal life. So all of this tells us about the old life versus the new life. As Jesus Christ was talking to these Pharisees and the scribes and the disciples of John, why aren't you fasting and praying the way that you should be? Why are you eating and drinking with these individuals? Again, we know their accusations and how they were very derogatory towards him and his disciples. We understand that while the bridegroom is amongst them, you should be celebrating but at the same time, he was also telling them, you know, your old way of fasting and praying, forget about it. There's a new mode of operation. There's a new mode of operation. And that's why, again, in the New Testament, it talks very little about fasting. And as I said on Tuesday, even in the Old Testament, there is only one commandment for community or corporate fasting. And that had to do with the Day of Atonement. Other than that, it was a voluntary thing that they would go forward with. And I even didn't even uh, uh, share with you, but some of you may already know, but the whole Nazarite vow, that Samson was a Nazarite. Paul took the Nazarite vow, and for a period of time, they would fast along with that vow, but it would go more importantly with their prayer life and their spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. But again, we don't see that as a command in the New Testament, fast, 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 here, there, and everywhere. There's no commandment. So there's a new mode of operation. And there's really not a need for fasting, per se, within the church age, although there's nothing wrong with it. It could be helpful if you think by so, uh, uh, you know, abstaining from food for a period of time, it helps you to focus more on your relationship with Jesus. By all means, do so. No problem. Nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, there's no command to do it. Because we have new power. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. We have the new nature. We're a new creation. And there is a whole new spiritual life that we are able to live in the church age that they could not live in the Old Testament time frame. They did not have the empowering and enabling ministry the way we do in the church. So again, with all this new ability and power, with the new life that we have, Again, we don't have to do the old to enhance that life. We've already got it, and we just need to live it. So the old versus the new is a theme that runs throughout and what Jesus Christ would accomplish for us. In Romans chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with. You see, that's what the old is all about. The old body of sin. And this goes beyond dispensations. Yes, a lot of this analogy is dispensation of uh, Israel versus the is dispensation of the church and the change of it from that. But it also has the understanding of the old nature called the sin nature that we were a slave to from the day of our birth until the day of our salvation and the new nature being born again from the day of our salvation now going forward. That's what this is all about. The old body versus the new body. In order that our body of sin, that's the old body, might be done away with so that we would no longer, what? Be slaves to sin. There's a new life for us to live. Jesus was pointing that out. This is the beginning of the discussion of that doctrine. Old versus new. Old garment, new garment. Old wine, new wine. Again, old wine skin, new wine skin. It's the beginning of the discussion that will be played out and also 
defined for us as Jesus continued his ministry. And then as we get into the, uh, the, uh, the book of Acts and then also into the epistles as uh, Paul and others would write for us. So that we would totally know what this was all about. That's the 2020 hindsight vision that we can bring to this that they might not have had. They had some analogy from Old Testament Scripture. I'm going to give you some interesting principles there as well. But we have even more understanding of what Jesus was saying, the introduction here of the new spiritual life that we are able to live. Now in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8, it says, Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. Okay, Old versus new. The old leaven, that's sin. The new lump, without sin. A new uh, a new nature that has been given to you. It says, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. And again, that doesn't mean we don't have a sin nature anymore. It just means we have a new nature that is without sin. That's the new human nature that has been recreated, regenerated in us. That's the born-again nature inside of us. It says, for Christ, our Passover, also has been sanctified. Oh, excuse me, sacrificed. Remember that. Christ our Passover. Okay? Christ our Passover. When was he crucified? On the Passover. What was the analogy that Jesus did uh, before he went to the cross? The whole bread, we understand that, but also what? The cup, which was wine at the Passover supper, the Last Supper. And then he went to the cross. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Remember, Christ our Passover also says he's the fulfillment of the feast that was given to Israel. He is our Passover. And again, we don't have to celebrate Passover. You can if you want, but you don't have to. No command to do that in the church because every day should be a celebration of the Passover because every day should be a celebration of Jesus Christ in your life. And for the church, every time we partake of communion, which only instructs us whenever you do it, doesn't mean we do it, uh, we we, we have to do it on certain days or we have to do it all the time. But whenever we do it, it's a celebration of the Passover that is now Christ. And again, Sunday will be our communion Sunday. We'll talk more about that when we get there. Then in verse 8, it says, Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, Not with the old nature, the sin nature. And we could even say, not according to the law in the old age, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, again, all sin, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Again, what we receive now through the word of God, the new nature inside of us, and now going forward in honesty and integrity inside the unique spiritual life for the church age. Now in 2 Corinthians 3.14, it says, But their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. Interesting, we got veil in this, okay? Unlifted. Because it is removed in Christ. Just as the veil inside the tabernacle was torn in two, removed at the sacrifice of Christ. Also, the veil of blindness and not seeing Christ as, as the Savior is still there until someone ultimately comes to believe in Jesus Christ. Then the veil is lifted and they have entrance and access into the new life that is Christ. Then we also see in Ephesians 4.22 that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, the old sin nature, the old man, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Lay aside that old nature. You've got a new nature to live in. Colossians 3.9 also tells us, Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. And again, that's what we should be doing, laying aside the old self, the old sin nature, the unregenerated man, and living in the new man that has been given to us. So then we understand that the old life, again, the age of the law, which is also, again, we could put an analogy here to the unregenerated man, is not compatible with the new life, which is the age of grace, and now the regenerated man who is in Christ. Again, the born-again believer. Remember, Jesus Christ had that great discussion with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You must be born again. 
Not back in your mother's womb, but a spiritual rebirth. That's the regenerated man. That's the new life that we get to live. And think of it, the age of the law. And I've got this, I don't know if it's in uh, Sunday's notes or tonight's notes and forgetting where everything is and where I put everything. A lot going on and a lot of information. But in any case, when we talk about the age of the law, remember the law was what, according to Galatians, uh, the book of Galatians, it was a tutor for us to see Christ. Okay, And that tutor told us what? What sin was. So when we say the law, we're seeing something that defines sin for us. When we talk about the unregenerated man, we're talking about the sinful man. So again, the law is holy and righteous. I understand that. I get it. But in analogy, it goes along with the unregenerated man. Because the unregenerated man, who is sin, was given an understanding of what sin was by the law. But now that Christ has come, now all things are new. Now all things are revealed. Now there's a new age called the age of grace. We're no longer under the law, which is a whole topic for another day. But we also have a new life, a new life to live in Christ because sin has been taken care of once and for all upon the cross. We just need to claim that forgiveness through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so... This all goes with the will. Before I get there, uh, the last word that we have, uh, or the last phrase in verse uh, 36, okay? And and it says, uh, again, No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old, Okay? And interesting enough, that phrase for will not match the old is a Greek word that is, again, it's got the Greek negative ouk, and then it's a verb, sumpho neo. And sum uh, is, is a prefix that means with or together with, and then phoneo, a sound, okay? So it's a sound that comes together. And it's a word that means in the Greek something that agrees with each other. That deals, uh, makes deals together, that has an alliance with. It means harmony. And it can be also be used for harmonizing. Okay, all the voices coming together and singing is one. Okay? But yet we have the Greek negative ook. In other words, it won't happen. And it's very interesting. And uh, again, this is a great understanding and a great example for people in the church age who are trying to live according to the law. And there are many Christians out there who still think we need to live by the law, if not all the law, certain parts of the law. And so they try to keep the law when there's no harmony there. It's a different age. There's a different spiritual life. There was a different spirituality that they had. They did not have the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit. Now, the things that the law was teaching, Christ has completed and fulfilled upon the cross. Now there's a new mode of operation going forward. Now no longer you need to fast. Now you should be celebrating. You see, those who are trying to keep the law are trying to live in the past, and they're trying to fast. Those who live by Christ are living in the new, the new nature, the new mode of operation, and they are celebrating by eating and drinking. In other words, participating in Christ. And oh, by the way, which again just come, came to mind uh, you know, by the inspiration of the Spirit, and we'll talk about this on communion as well, We didn't even talk about eating and drinking, at least I don't think we did, about eating and drinking also being what? The communion supper. Eat the bread, drink the wine. Eating and drinking. It's a celebration. It's a time of thanksgiving and rejoicing. But if you go back to the law, you're not going to eat and drink. You're going to be fasting. And guess what? That is an old garment that is trying to live in a new garment, and there's no harmony and the two ultimately will destroy one another in other words you won't have the complete 
spiritual life. You might be saved. Some people might not be saved because they, they might even bring in, I've got to keep the law in order to be saved. That's what a lot of religion does. And again, the law that they try to keep is a new man-made law of their do's and don'ts and their rites and rituals. You can't be saved if you think that's the weight of salvation. And even if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, faith alone and Christ alone, and you try to go back and keep some you know, a dogmatic rules and responsibilities or edicts of religion, or try to keep the law, you might be saved, but you're going to destroy your spiritual life. You're truly not going to live it, because you can't do it. The two do not go together. That's why we have a new covenant. That's why we have a new testament to live by the new mode of operation for the unique spiritual life of the age in which we live in, not the old. So we've got to give up on the old, and we've got to live the new. We don't throw out the old. We learn from the old. We see the pictures and the analogy from the old, but we can't apply the old to live the spiritual life in the church age. We have to apply the Word of God and the application of the old regarding the new for the age in which we live in. We see it as a tutor. We see it as a guide. We see it as pointing to the Christ. But now that we know the Christ, we live according to the New Testament as to how to live by Christ. So again, that little phrase, will not match. Again, the two do not go together. Now, there's one other thing that I think I skipped over that I just wanted to share with you. And again, maybe this is coming up. Let me just look real quick at my notes. Yeah, it's coming up in another word, but it is somewhat apropos. That whole tearing and renting apart, which we're going to see again uh, you know, in further analogy uh, in, in, in some of the uh, Greek words coming up. It also has a connotation of either a dog or the swine, like a wild animal, tearing something apart. And we're going to see that at the very end in the word ruined, okay? It's about getting torn apart by a swine or a dog, okay? Ripping it uh, totally apart. And so again, that's what's in view as Jesus is leading up to the upcoming phrases that we're going to note. He's basically saying, you know, it's going to be destroyed. And there's going to be an animal that comes in and destroys these things. And what is that animal? It's called Satan and the old sin nature. The old nature, the old man. And again, John, we could go off on the animal whole discussion that starts from Genesis and goes all the way throughout the Old Testament. And the sin nature and the old man is really analogous to the animal nature and the animals that uh, 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 Adam named in the Garden of Eden. And we see that going right through the Bible. You could just look at the word animal and do a whole study. We heard a podcast on this. Go through the whole uh, you know, Old and New Testament about the animal nature, which really is referring to the old sin nature and the old man. And all kinds of analogies and great uh, understanding of Scripture from that. But moving on now in verse 37. All right? It says, "...and no one puts new wine into old wine skins." Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled out, and the skins will be ruined. Okay, we're going to see that upcoming. All right, so again, no one puts this, okay? Yes, literally, he's talking about something they could all understand. You see, back in the day, they didn't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the glass jars and containers the way we do today, although they did have a lot of clay jars and things like that. And there was actually, uh, uh, there's some uh, historical uh, digs and records where they recognized that people took wine and put it into a clay jar and then put a lid on it. And by putting the lid on it, they think, well, it won't ferment as fast. You see, when fermentation happens to wine, again, the wine starts to bubble, it starts to expand and increase, okay? And if there's no space for it to expand and increase, the jar is going to do what? It's going to burst and spill all over the place, okay? And they found archaeological digs where they've uh, understood that that wine has cost those jars to burst, okay? But what they did have back in the day was lots of animal skins, okay? And so they used animal skins to make 
different types of jugs, okay? Or sacks, as we would call them, and they would fill those up with wine. And when you would take a new animal skin, again, at first it was very pliable, and you could put the new wine into it, let it go through its fermenting process, and let it expand. And, the, and, and with the f fermenting process that wanted to expand, the new wine skin, or the new skin, would expand along with it. But after a period of time, once that wine skin has been expanded, and maybe you drink all the wine out of it, that skin becomes what? Hard and brittle. And you can use it to hold liquid, but you can't use it to hold the liquid that's going to continue to expand. So you can't take an old wine skin that's already expanded already, stretched out already, and think it's going to stretch some more for you because it's not going to. And when the wine is in there and wants to expand, what's it going to do? It's going to burst. It's going to tear it apart, and it's going to spill all over the place. So that's why Jesus Christ says, logically, okay, and again, this isn't, you know, you know, uh, great wisdom from above. This is human wisdom. No one puts new wine into an old wine skin. You don't do it. Logically, you don't do it. You don't take what's new and put it back into the old. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will spill out, or be spilled out. We'll talk about all these words. I don't think I'm going to get it all in tonight. And the skins will be ruined. So we'll get into that uh, and, and uh, break it down. Basically, the new wine speaks to the born-again believer here. All right, This is the new wine, the new spiritual life, the new born-again believer. When we talk about the, it, it actually the new wine skin, I should have up there on the board because uh, that's what it's all about. But again, the new wine put into an old wine skin, and then you have uh, new wine put into a new wine skin. We have that analogy. So the new wine is basically, again, the born-again believer. And you don't take the new life, the new spiritual life that you have, and put it back into the old. And again, you can't live like the unregenerated man and think you're going to live the new spiritual life. At the same time, you can't live the new life uh, 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 of Christ for the church age by keeping the law, which is the old wine skin. Okay? As it says in, in verse 38, new wine must be put into a new wine skin. But we'll get to that uh, in just a minute. But in verse 37, we're talking about the new wine, and we're talking about the old wine skin, the new wine, the new spiritual life, the old wine skin, the old mode of operation, the age of Israel, the age of the law. But I wanted to focus on this phrase, the new wine. Now, the words new also have connotation for us, and we'll speak to that in just a minute. But when we talk about the first use of wine within Scripture, the first five time we find wine in Scripture is found in Genesis chapter 9, verse 21 and 24. Let's turn there. Let's go look at that. Let's get you into the Scriptures and so you don't, don't have to listen to me all the time. All right? Genesis chapter 9. And this is a very interesting storyline because we have Noah and his ark, and they've already found... New late already stopped raining. They already found ground, uh, found new ground. And one of the first things that Noah does was go out and he builds a vineyard. Okay, and again, all kinds of analogy there about God's plan and you know God working uh, uh, His spiritual life for all of us. All kinds of analogy there. All right, but then wi what we see is what what's the product of the vineyard? Grapes. And then what do you do for, with grapes? You make wine from it. Now, from this wine, in verse 21 through 24, we see something happening. In verse 20, it says, Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. In other words, he was naked. Now, that word uncovered also means he probably was entering into sexual relationship with his wife. Okay? That's what that uncovered is all about. And you can see that when you get into the law. And it talks about, you know, this one shouldn't uncover that one, and that one shouldn't uncover this one. It means about sexual relationship, okay? So when it says Noah was uncovered, he was naked and probably entering into sexual relationship with his wife. It's a good thing. No problem with that, all right? 
All right, he entered his in tent in uh, himself inside his tent, okay? He did it in privacy. He wasn't out in public so everybody could see. He did it in privacy, as he should. And Ham, the father of Cana, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Gossip chain, okay? Gossiping. And we also see maligning here, okay? We see gossiping. We see airy the dirty laundry, as it were, telling his two brothers. But Shem and Jepheth took a garment. Oh, okay, we got garment in here too. All right, so we see an analogy back to what we're talking about. And laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. In other words, they covered up his father and probably the mother too that were there, okay, and covered their nakedness up. So ultimately it wouldn't be on display for all to see. All right. It says, and their faces were turned away. They didn't want to look upon what was going on because they shouldn't have. They should have given her privacy so that they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, again, when he sobered up, he knew what his youngest son had done and said to him, so he said, cursed is Cana, a servant of servants, and shall be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Cana be his servant. May God enlarge Jepheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Shem became Israel. And let Cana be his servant. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. All right, so I bring all this to your attention because we see wine. And in the first analogy of wine, or the use of wine, that we see in the Bible, we see two things. We see something good, and we see something bad. First, we saw something bad, all right? We saw Noah getting drunk, a little bad. And then we also saw what? One of his sons pointing out his nakedness or the sexual relationship that he was having with his mother. And so we see him pointing that out and gossiping about it and telling everybody out there, airing the dirty laundry. We see what? Mental and verbal sins. But then we see something good. What do we see good? The other two brothers who had more wisdom and maybe more faith, they did what? They covered up the nakedness of their father. You see, the first son uncovered it. In other words, showed sin. The second and third sons, they covered sin. And that's all an analogy with wine. And again, going back to wine, and again, when the scribes and Pharisees, remember the Pharisees were all lawyered up, they could go back and say, okay, what was Jesus talking about, this wine stuff? Let's go back in the Bible, and let's see, let's go back into the Old Testament. Let's go back to the, to the law, which includes the book of Genesis, okay? Let's go back and see what wine is talking about. And they would have said the dual analogy. And that's what we have throughout, the old wine and the new wine. We see a bad wine, we see a good wine. Here we see the bad wine calling out sin. In the New Testament, it's the same thing. When we talk about wine, many times it's in the negative aspect. Don't get drunk with wine. It's a waste of time, but be filled with the Spirit. Other times we see wine used in a good analogy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his work on the cross to what? Pay for the penalty of our sins. So we see the duality here of the use of wine going all the way back to Genesis. One, wine could represent sin and the making of sin amongst man. Two, wine represents the covering up of sin, the forgiveness of sins that Jesus Christ would perform for all of us upon the cross. So again, the scribes and Pharisees, they had opportunity to go back to the law and discover these things. You and I discover these things as we look uh, throughout the Old and the New Testament as well. So we see the duality. And in Romans chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, it says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have what? Been covered. Again, Jesus Christ, with the new covenant of the new wine, as it were, covered our sins. And blessed, as it says in verse 8, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. 
You see, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins so that we would not have to. He has covered every sin that we would have. As the old wine, with the old wine skin, is speaking about the old life and the old sin nature, the unregenerated man. There's a new wine with new wine skins that speak of the covering of our sins, which was accomplished by Jesus Christ upon the cross. And as we're going to see when we come back on Sunday as well, because we're running out of time tonight, we're going to see again the celebration of the wine, the bread and the wine of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which really talks about Him paying for our sins. Let me just leave you with this in Psalm chapter uh, 50, uh, excuse me, 85, verse 2. It says, You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sins. And that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross for the forgiveness of the sins of all of mankind. And as a result of him covering our sins, we're going from the old, now we get to enter into the new. And the changeover period was the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his ministry here on planet Earth. And so as these Pharisee scribes and even the disciples of John came to Jesus and said, you're a demon-possessed individual, you eat and drink, you're not fasting and praying, you're not righteous like we are, you and your disciples... Jesus Christ turned it around and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You have no idea what you're talking about. And there's something new. And I'm demonstrating that newness to you. I am here. The bridegroom is here. Your Messiah King is here. The promised one is here. You should be celebrating. And ultimately, that is also going to usher in a new spiritual life for you to live like no one has been able to experience ever before. And you should be rejoicing in that. And put aside the old so that now you can live in the new. All right, so we'll come back on Sunday and uh, uh, hopefully, I think we'll be able to finish up uh, the rest of these verses and finish up chapter 5. All right, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for sending your son into the world to give us this new life that we so richly enjoy in Jesus Christ. And we thank you also for our spiritual life that we have to live and our salvation that is unto you. And so, Father, we just ask that you lead us to live the new spiritual life more and more each and every day as we glorify you and your Son. We ask now for your travel blessings on our way home. In Christ's precious name, amen.